but it's just human nature to want to reciprocate. If you serve somebody, they'll want to serve you back. So whatever you want, do that for other people. If you want referrals, give other people referrals. If you want them to ask you for your business card, you off, ask them for theirs first. Hey, do you have a business card, Josh? Yeah, here you go. How about you, Chris? Do you have a business card? So whatever you put out there, in most cases, it's going to reciprocate. So when you, you know, just, just understanding these dynamics, hopefully that, that helps you. So... Welcome to the Web Design Business Podcast with your host, Josh Hall, helping you build a web design business that gives you freedom and a lifestyle you love. Welcome, friends, into episode 253, where we're going to take a deep dive into what I know is your very favorite aspect of being a web designer. No, it's not coding. It's not designing. It's not creating rewarding websites for clients. It is networking, more specifically in-person networking. All right. So done with the facetiousness here. Yes. I have talked with so many students and I felt this way myself for many years where you dread networking. You, you don't become a web designer to go to in-person network events, but I'll tell you this. If you are going to grow your business and you're going to be the salesperson, you have to get yourself out there in some form or another. Now you don't have to network in person, but it is one of the quickest ROIs for growing your business fast and building a really good, healthy client base. And I share this in this episode, but over 50% of my income in a six figure web design business that I grew stemmed from my networking group. So there's a lot of value in it. So if you're terrified of doing this, I wanted to do an episode specifically to help you out. Or for those of you who need help with this, this is going to be your episode. I'm extra excited about this because I'm bringing on a personal friend of mine, Chris Borja, who is local to me and actually got me plugged in with a Toastmasters group, which is a public speaking and leadership style group. What's really interesting about Chris, among other things, is that he is a and was a uh, petrified introvert, I guess is probably the best way to put it. He was terrified of networking and doing in-person things. Now, several years later, he literally wrote a book on networking. His new book is called Networking Essentials for Success. When I found out that he has taken his knowledge and experience and wrote a book about it, I said, Chris, first of all, I want to reconnect. And second of all, I want to have you on the podcast. So that's exactly what we do. Chris shares basically all the tips to make networking made easy. He's got a really cool seven step formula that he's going to dive into here. And before I bring him on, I do want to say Chris is actually going to be coming into web designer pro here at the time of releasing this uh, in a couple months in May of 2023 to do a live training. So if you're catching this episode before May of 2023, you can join web designer pro and watch the live training with Chris and ask questions live to him after his training. So uh, super excited about that. For right now, though, let's talk networking, how to make it easy, how to make it fun, and learn from Chris's journey from introvert to successful networker. Here we go. Well, Chris, man, it is so good to see you. It's We were just chatting before I hit record here. It's been like, I think it's been at least five years since we've connected. So, man... Uh, how are you? How's it going? Yeah, we're doing great. Yeah, and time time just flies. It just flies by. So, but thank uh, thankful for social media because I've been keeping up with you on there. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, same with me, man. I mean, I I've been able to keep up with you mainly through Facebook. I think is where I see most of your stuff. And when I think about networking. I think of you, Chris, because I've always known you as like a networking guy. I I think we originally crossed paths when I was in a networking group. And then I I heard about Toastmasters. At one point, I read a book and it mentioned to get in Toastmasters. And then somebody mentioned they were in a Toastmasters group and it helped. And then I saw somebody say, hey, I would recommend you get in Toastmasters. And then I knew you were in Toastmasters. So I was like, all right, I feel like that's a sign. I'm going to hit Chris up and... Um, you got me connected there and it was a huge benefit, even the short time I was in that group, uh, just professionally. So yeah, I view you as a connector and a networker. I mean, is that, is that how you like to be viewed? Is that kind of what you're all about when it comes to being a networker is, I guess the question I have to kick us off is be like, what's the, what's the power of being a connector? Uh, the power of being, well, I'm, I'm okay with that title. It's, it's, uh, it's a, it's a perfectly fine title for me. And, uh, being, being a connector is, is just that it's a, it's a servant 
leadership type opportunity and position and something that I, I kind of morphed into is, is not something that I started off as and say, Hey, I'm going to be a connector. I started the journey initially, just like most people looking to promote my own business and drum up new prospects and clients. But being the connector is really what it's all about being able to serve and provide for needs and basically connect the dots in the community. Oh, that's a cool analogy. And I, I usually ask this question first. We'll, we'll ask it second in this round. Um, when people ask you what you do, Chris, what do you tell them? I, well, I tell them that I, I connect people for a living. I tell them that I run a networking group and help people learn how to connect with each other. And does that, uh, I, does it depend on the room you're in with what kind of response that gets? Or you could make it creepy and just say I'm a connector and give them a long stare, I would imagine. Yeah, it, it definitely adjusts. It's one of the things I teach too is to have a modular introduction or elevator speech, so to speak, because that way it's it's relevant to the audience that we're speaking to. So I do change that fairly often depending on the group that I'm talking to. And do you, I mean, again, I kind of, when I think about networking, I think about you, what do you like... I guess, what are your thoughts on networking now versus when we got connected maybe six or seven years ago? Because things have changed a lot, particularly in the wake of a Zoom world and connection is not just in person at networking groups, but it's online. There's more video calls now than ever. I think people are more accustomed to connecting and maybe networking online. Um, What are your thoughts on the landscape right now with how networking has changed? I, I like where it's gone. I, I mean, we didn't want to go virtual at first. I think most people were resistant to going with virtual chats and they're really, like, oh, I just need to meet in person. But I think it's opened up a whole new um, window for people to stay connected across the world fairly easily. It's just a matter of knowing how to do it. So I, I actually like the landscape now. And oftentimes when it comes down to to having that one-to-one meeting, it used to rely on a coffee meeting at a local coffee shop or something like that. But now it's as easy as hopping on a 15-minute Zoom call and you could still see each other and you could still create very strong relationships, but not let time or logistics get in the way. So I I actually like the, the landscape now and we still have the ability to meet in person. And speaking of in person, my personal feeling is that in an online world, the more opportunities you have in person, it's just going to be that much greater. Like, because you said a lot of people aren't meeting in coffee shops, but the time you do meet in a coffee shop face to face, I found that to be like 10 times more powerful than it was a decade ago. Would you agree with, with that? And, and the, the idea of it just being more powerful nowadays in person? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a lot more special to, to meet in person, especially if it's somebody that you already know or have been staying in touch with and then you reach out and actually want to meet in person. Uh, I think it just makes it that much more special because of the it's, it's actually extra effort and energy and it's an extra investment to be able to do that nowadays. But uh, the, the way I look at it is that you use both. So you really want to turn your in-person connections into online connections and you want to turn your online connections into in-person connections. So it, it, wherever you start with is fine, but you always want to try to add that extra element to it. When you have both, it's powerful. So, for example, we haven't really talked much in five years, but we've stayed connected. We've stayed in touch. We're still somewhat involved in each other's lives and seeing you, you and your family grow and just staying in touch through through social But now we catch up like this and it feels like it hasn't been five years because we still see what's going on. It's not like we have that long um, catch up period. And I run into people all the time that I've met literally several years ago and we just pick right up where we left off. So I think it's a very unique time that we live in. And it's a I think it's just a great time to to be able to utilize all the tools that we have available to us. I'm curious with the term networking, it has such a, like a sour connotation to a lot of people, particularly my audience. I mentioned to you before we went live, a lot of my audience, web designers, 
when it comes to networking and sales and in-person stuff and, or even virtual calls or groups, it's generally a, a pain point and a challenge for a lot of people because it may not be natural. Not too many people want to build websites and do all the sales and be the, the face of the business. Um, so the term networking often gets this like, uh, reaction, but I learned to absolutely love networking, but a lot of it, for me personally was that I did not view networking as going to an event with 300 people and getting 300 business cards. I learned to view networking as just connecting with people, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or a few different people. What are your thoughts? And do, do you feel like the term connection and networking is the same or similar, or do you feel like they're different things? I feel it's different because most people associate networking as something that's more on the sales side, like you network to be able to to present or to sell something. You know, you have something to, to offer and that's why you're networking in the first place. I think it's just that's the connotation that you're talking about where it feels like there's some ulterior motive to the connection or it's transactional. You know, it's like that business card exchange and it's awkward, but the 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 thing that i really encourage i had somebody ask me earlier today what would your tip be for somebody who's brand new to networking and how do you help alleviate you know some of their anxiety or help them to navigate their first event or just getting started and and my tip was to get to know the person behind the business behind the title behind the profile because oftentimes that's where we get stuck when you talk about traditional networking. It's like, hey, I'm so-and-so and here's my role and position and that kind of stuff. But if you can get to know that, that actual person, that's where the connection happens. We don't connect with each other's job titles or roles or responsibility. We connect with other people that are like us. And you talk to anybody and you'll find more in common than you will find differences. So for your audience... I, I get it. I understand because I wasn't somebody that wanted to be out there in the marketplace and, you know, uh, rubbing elbows and socializing, doing all that stuff. I would, in fact, avoid that at all costs as a former shy introvert. I would I would avoid social settings, anything where I had public speaking, which meant talking to three or more people that was considered uh, public speaking for me. But as, as I as I learned and started to, to grow is it's just connecting with the people. And, and oftentimes when we'd host our events, we would create environments to where it's more comfortable. So for example, I would give an instruction and say, okay, I'll pair everyone up and with somebody they don't know. So it kind of levels the playing field. Everyone already knows that they're talking to a new person. There's no clicks. There's no, you know, friends already. Everyone is meeting with somebody new. So mentally they're already in that space to where we're all meeting somebody new. And then what I would challenge them to do, I say, okay, you're going to get to know each other, but you're not allowed to talk any business. So you can't talk about what you do. You can't ask them what they do, but you're just going to talk about anything personal, share two or three um, personal facts about yourself. It could be travel. It could be pets, family, where you live, uh, you know, something on your bucket list, someplace you've traveled, literally anything at all except business. And you'll feel the energy level in the room just go through the roof. Because now they're truly connecting with each other. There's no anxiety. There's no fear. It doesn't matter if they're introvert or extrovert. It doesn't matter if they've been networking for years or if they just came to their very first event. So the level is level playing field. And now they're just truly getting to know one another. And then I'll stop them. And then I'll say, okay, what was that experience like? And they're everyone universally like, it was fun. We had a blast. You know, did you meet somebody cool? Like, yeah, I met somebody really cool. I say, how many of you actually are curious about what they do for a living. And all of a sudden they're like realizing that I actually care about what this person does. And mm. now when they explain and say, so now we're going to go back, same partner. And, but this time you get to learn a little bit about each other and what you do for a living and what you're looking to accomplish. What are your goals, how you got started, whatever you want to talk about on the professional level. So it just changes the whole dynamic. And so for your audience where you're thinking about like, Hey, I don't want to go out and do that. But what if you just got to know people and connected from that level and then see how you could find ways to collaborate rather than sell. And that's a different mindset. So when we help people get to know the people and not the titles, it, it changes the whole dynamic and it makes it a lot more fun. It makes it authentic. And there's not that nervousness of, you know, do I say the perfect elevator pitch to win them over in 30 seconds? Because you have unlimited time once you become a friend. 
What a great story and what a great example of the distinction between networking and connection, because I, I really did kind of lump those two together. But what you just explained really challenged my mindset with keeping them separate. And I think they feed into each other for sure. Like you can network and build connection or you can connect in the network. But I love that separation because networking can And I guess by definition probably does include some sort of like sale or mutual benefit versus connection, which is just purely human, human connecting on a, on a different level. I love that, Chris, because that I do feel like if somebody to, to just reiterate kind of what you said, if you are nervous, if you go in with it, with this mindset of, I just want to connect and be who I am, share who I am, share what I know, and then get to know somebody versus I have got to sell a website in this meeting. Uh, it just takes the the pressure and the weight off of having to feel like you need to sell all the time. So it's a great message, man. I love that you have that approach. How long did it come or how long did it take for you to come to that realization and that mindset in your uh, quote unquote networking endeavors? Um, about a week ago. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> oh, a decade. It, it is probably, it was probably a few years in, it was about, so I started 2012, it was probably about three or four years of, well, it was a few years before I realized that there's a better way than what I had been doing it from the time I started networking. And then it was, it was shortly after that, that I realized that I was going about it the wrong way. And I just started focusing on building relationship, but it took me a few years after that to realize that I needed to help other people understand this as well, because it was helping me now because I was able to actually connect with people, but I didn't realize what I was doing. It's just kind of somebody you become proficient at something. It's just, it's become second nature and you don't think about it anymore. Yeah. But in 2014, when I started teaching networking and initially I didn't have any intention of it being a business. I was just helping people because I didn't want them to be as uncomfortable as I was. But then over time, I realized that there's things that I was doing that would be that would be beneficial to others for their own journey. But more importantly, it would be import, it, it would create a, a greater impact on our communities and our overall networking circles because networking is a, a team sport. So I realized that helping others do this, like just imagine that room of people connecting with each other it's hard to separate them anymore. They just can't stop talking to each other. They could talk to that same person the rest of the night and just have a blast. So uh, I think once people pick up on that, um, it's, it's contagious. But for me, it took a few years to even realize that that's what I was doing. I was actually just getting to know people and vice versa. And that's where I was getting the referrals. So from, you know, for somebody that is not a salesperson, to me, this is the best way to be able to do what you do, be what, you know, be the best at what you do, but still be able to get the message out there without turning, having to change hats. You know, you could just be the same person, but then they just, um, you know, they just remember you and you become branded for, for what you do. Yeah. And before you built your personal brand and started teaching networking, what, what were you selling? Like, what were you doing when you, it sounds like, I don't know if you intentionally entered the networking world or if you were forced to with the position you were in, but what did the beginning of your networking journey look like? At the beginning I was offering a, I was in a direct sales network marketing company, which is, you know, a great place for a shy introvert, right? Now you got to go drop your own business. <laughs> I was just going to say, isn't it like an introvert's nightmare to be in yeah. like Amway or uh, ACN or something like that? Yeah. So it's, it's, but the good thing is that most of those companies have a big focus on personal development, self-development. And that's something that I think helped me and pushed me out, but that was initially it. And, you know, you're responsible for generating your own contacts and leads and you have a system and a process, but the people aren't included. You got to add the people. And that's, what's usually missing in success for, for, for most entrepreneurs and business owners is that they need more people to know what they do. They could be the best at what they do. However, if others don't know about them, their, their success is going to be limited by that fact. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's what, that's where I started was in that network marketing business. And that's what got me into networking to start with is because I was just, I was looking for a better way. I knew I couldn't sustain the sales style of traditional business growth of, you know, talking to, 50, you know, dialing 50 people a day or sending out a bunch of cold messages. And I just see even now more than ever, 
those are, are becoming less and less effective because it's not even a person that screens it out. It's just people don't have any hang up about not answering the phone or not returning a message. And in, in the old days, if you didn't return a call, it was considered unprofessional to not return a phone call. It's perfectly acceptable now. If you don't want to talk to somebody, you just literally look at it and just keep on with your day and you don't lose any sleep over that. And that's the yeah. society we live in. And it becomes even more important for us to build that relationship to, to where we, people will respond when, when they're, you know, when we make a call or a request of some type. That's a good point. It may be a volume thing t- too now, like culturally, I wonder if just, we're all just getting so much more inbound with different social media, different connection platforms, different, different professional venues, different calls, spam calls, automated calls, everything. It's like, there's just such a bigger, inf- like, like, like I remember, I mean, how many, when I think about old people, how many times if they get a phone call, they're like, oh, I'm answering it. I, I don't know who this is, but I'm going to answer it. It was probably very different in their day when you might get two or three calls a day versus now, like I never answer a phone number unless I know it, or unless I think it's like children's hospital for my daughter or something like that. You know, like I know the numbers I'm going to answer, but pretty much everyone else. No, I'm not going to answer. Um, so yeah, it might be a volume thing, which does make int- networking. I think, I don't know, maybe that makes that trickier now to cut through the noise. That's kind of an interesting place to lead us to like the landscape now, while it is exciting, what are the, Okay, here we go. What are the challenges now with the fact that there are so many different platforms and ways to network? I mean, I, Chris, I could hit you up on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, wherever you are, but like what that's that breeds a lot of challenges now for, for people. So, what are your thoughts on, yeah, the, you know, there's a lot of opportunity, but opportunity also makes things tricky, I've found. Yeah, I think it, it's, um, I think it's a matter of knowing who your audience is and where your audience hangs out and not jumping on to the next thing. As soon as it pops up, mm. you know, be that early adopter. Sometimes it makes sense, but many of those also disappear just as quickly as they arrived. The, the way I, I guide people is to, to guide them in the same way that, you know, when we were in school, you, you can't major in five different topics, no matter how much you like them, because it means you didn't have a major. And I think that's what happens with social and different platforms for networking. So what I what I encourage people to do is to pick a major, pick a minor, and then you have your electives. But pick one that you dominate. And it's because it's hard to dominate multiple areas, you know, even in sports and life, you just don't see people dominate in multiple categories. It's usually one category that they can dominate at. And that's hard enough to do just to, to, to be on top of one. So I say to pick a major, the one that's your primary in business. Most of the time, the major is going to be LinkedIn for most of them, because you can directly access whoever you need to, you could do a direct search. Um, and if it's more visual then Instagram works great. Uh, if your audience is a little bit older and not as much of the young generation, Facebook still works great. So I would say pick a major, pick a minor, and then the rest are electives. So for example, my Instagram, I have an Instagram, but it's not my major or my minor. It's an elective. I just post stuff on there and it's, it's cool, but I don't invest a lot of time on it. If somebody goes there, I have a presence, but it's not like it's what I'm using to, to drive business. I'm going to primarily use LinkedIn, number one, and Facebook, number two. And everyone's going to be different depending on what field they're in. So people that are in a lot, lot more visual field, I think they can, you know, go with, with with Instagram or even if their audience is younger, go to a TikTok or something like that. Yeah, that's a great analogy. I love that. I never thought about it like that major and and the elective kind of kind of situation. I love that. Um, I do want to go back to something earlier that you were talking about. You said when you started networking, you were a few years in and you realized you were doing a lot of things, maybe the wrong way or things that uh, like networking, the lens changed for you. What were some of the things, I don't want to go too negative, although you're such an optimist. I know we won't stay here long, but what were the, some of the things that you did that were not good things to do or, or that you learned the hard way when it came to networking? That's a very good question. And I, I call them cringe worthy moments, those times that we wish we, we could just disappear and you can't believe you just did that. But <laughs> one in particular that I do remember, it was, well, I was go. I'm excited. <laughs> and I was at a I was at a young professionals event, which meant that everyone was about half my age. So people usually think I look younger, but I'm already 50. So it's it's I was I was this is like 10 years, so I was about 40 years old, and everyone was like in their early twenties. 
And they asked me what I did. And I told them what I did. But I also proceeded because I had like five different people's attention. They're all looking at me. So I started to um, explain more about what we did. And then it turned into like a baby sales presentation without me realizing. I was just an autopilot. And I was already starting to pitch on all the benefits of the services. I'm excited about what I was offering. So I was like, they seem to be listening. They seem to be attentive. And one of the people right across from me just cut me off without addressing me. So just turned to the person to the side and say, hey, so what do you do for a living? And I was just like, felt like, oh, man, I just got to disappear from this room and never come back again. Hope they don't remember me. So people half my age cut me off and uh, just left me hanging right there mid sentence. Just And so I don't know how long they were thinking that before they actually decided. I'm sure I went well beyond the idea of cutting me off. But yeah, those, those things happen. And um, I used to bring flyers to the event because I wanted to give out flyers and you know, invite people to something I was doing or to, you know, see some of my services. And then I look back at other people that do that. And I, I again, cringeworthy moments. I just, I can't believe, I, I can't believe that was me doing that. And then you have the the blackjack dealers. Fortunately, I didn't do this, but something that I also see is, a, is the blackjack dealers. I call them that because they give out two cards to everybody, just in case you already have a referral for them after they met you. So they're just out <laughs> distributing, distributing cards like a blackjack dealer. And, um, <laughs> So, so for me, it was, that was a, a, a you know, kind of embarrassing, embarrassing moment. Um, and then a lot of awkward stuff too, that I just learned the hard way. I went to my first coffee meeting. I didn't even know you're supposed to meet people for coffee or meet for one-to-ones and somebody invited me and I went there and I ended up stuck in their sales presentation for 45 minutes going through 40 slides or something like that. And I oh. didn't know what to do. I was brand new to it. I had no clue. It was just very awkward as they're presenting. And that was one of my early exposures to, you know, in the networking, early exposures in the networking journey. And I didn't know, I guess that's what you're supposed to do. You go sell people at these things. And so that, uh, you know, so that's what I did. I I would show up with back then a briefcase with flyers and brochures and stuff ready to share. I looked like I was, I had swatches for, you know, choose different color uh, paint for your wall or carpet samples or whatever. It reminds me, one of my, one of my mentors is Pat Flynn, who has had a really successful online entrepreneur career. And he told me one of his mentors, he didn't know, got into some sort of networking, uh, network marketing thing. And he invited him for coffee and Pat thought that we were just going to have coffee and catch up. And it was the same thing. It was like a 45 minute spiel, just like overloaded them, you know, and that is, so I guess it's a good lesson to set the context of a meeting, right? Like I would imagine we would want to make sure there's a clear agenda, whether it is a like catch up, hang out. Like there's nothing worse for me than when somebody sends me a very vague message, like, Hey, I have a question or, Hey, I wanted to pick your brain about something. And I'm like, what the hell does that mean? Like, do you want to ask me business advice? Are you looking for consultation? Do you want to ask something personal? Like, or do you want, you know, like I have no idea. So it's a great, I guess that's probably a good networking, uh, one-on-one type of thing is to set the contacts in the stage for success for any sort of meeting. Yeah. What's, what's the purpose? Why would you want to, to meet? And it's, it's good to be upfront on that purpose, uh, for like, on um, for example, on my calendar app, you know, where I have people book time with me, one of the options is to just get to know each other. And that's mm-hmm. perfectly fine if that's the context, if that's the expectation is that we just get to know each other, but don't do the bait and switch. Hey, just love to get to know you better. And then boom, there you go. And you, you're, you're, you're in a needs analysis form deep, you know, <laughs> and yeah. uh, it's, it's one of those things, just setting the expectations. And if it's somebody that wants to present, then let that be clear. So that way the other person knows and expects that because I mean, maybe they want that there, there's times where maybe they are, are actually interested in learning more about what the person offers. It's not a bad thing. It's just a matter of being clear and communicating that. Yeah. I remember, uh, Oh, now I'm having all these flashbacks to Uh-oh. 10 years ago when I was getting <laughs> hit left and right with these network marketing things where it was like, in the beginning, I didn't quite understand what a vague meeting would be. Typically it was, it was that situation. I am, uh, I respond personally better to somebody just saying like, Hey, there's an opportunity. I'd like to see if you'd like to be a, a fit or just if you'd like more information about it, that seemed to go way better. Cause I do remember one of my friends, asked me if I could help out with their business. And I thought he meant like design a website for them. 
So I show up with my laptop, I got my notebook out, I'm ready to take notes for doing some design work for them. And then it was a networking marketing spiel. And I was like, it really threw me off. And then I learned to weed those out pretty quickly. And, and I've just, I don't know, I hope this is a good tip for everybody. Like, be direct. I mean, be friendly and, and, and connective, but I have learned that, especially nowadays, being direct and concise will save both parties a lot of time. Like when I reached out to you, Chris, for this podcast interview, I, I hope I didn't come across vague in any way. I straight up said, Hey, I love what you're up to. I'd love to reconnect. I want to have you on my podcast. Your networking tips would be such a great fit for the audience. Boom. There we go. I don't know if you took it that way, but like, hopefully it was pretty clear what the, the purpose of this chat was going to be. Yep. And here we are. So it worked. <laughs> here we are. So some good, uh, good what not to do's. What are some maybe like practical tips on networking that you've, that you've seen that have helped? Um, I'm a big fan of, for example, educating clients. I, it dawned on me one day that I don't need to sell if I just educate. Uh, so that's one of my practical tips. I always, I always tell my students, but what about you, Chris, what are some things that maybe you've learned on a practical level that somebody can implement if they go to a meeting tomorrow kind of thing? Yeah, with short notice and with zero training, what I shared earlier, it it changed. It's a game changer to just learn how to connect with the people behind the profile because usually people have anxieties and fears because they have an agenda. And I remember that's how I was. I would talk to somebody, and part of me was thinking about how do I flip this conversation around to talk about what I want to talk about. So uh, you gotcha. have designers, or you have people that want to offer a service, and inside they're thinking about how am I going to flip this conversation around or how do I find out if they have a need or how do I ask them if they need a website or if they need some design work that's going to affect the connection so I think there's so what I what I do is I actually help people by having a structure that normally doesn't that, that most people don't have because the meeting people part is actually the middle of all of the steps that I teach people Usually they think they want to learn how to meet people first and then they can do everything else later. Or they think, teach me all the stuff so I learn how to meet people. And that's the end goal is to learn how to meet people and to navigate these events. For me, that's dead center right in the middle of the whole process. So what I do is I, I help people and my, my advice is to have all seven steps and understand where you're going. Just like anything, you have a framework, you know where you want to take your clients and you help them on a framework to get there. And I'm the same way because if they don't have all the steps, it's not going to be a finished product. It's like trying to bake a cake and you don't have all the ingredients. Well, first, why don't you find out what the ingredients are, then find out what the sequence of putting the ingredients and making that cake so you can get that predictable result. Most people don't have that when it comes to networking. They think they just need to feel more comfortable because that's where I was. I just didn't want to be uncomfortable that was the initial goal. And then I wanted to make sales. And I didn't realize that making sales is a shorter term goal. I mean, it's a short sighted goal rather than what's really available through networking. So if you, you're okay, I'll, I'll share the seven steps real quick. I'll Let's do it. I was just going to ask. Perfect segue. Yep. But um, so, so, so the first thing starts with clarity. I'm sure just like you and many of your listeners start with clarity. What exactly do you want? What are your goals? Why do you want to accomplish that? How do you come What, what, what value do you provide for your clients? What do you want to come across? Right? What do you want to present? What are the pain points that you solve? But one step beyond that from a networking standpoint is who else can help you connect to your client? The traditional prospect is how do I get in front of my client? So for some of your listeners are like, how do I get somebody that can hire me? But the other question to ask is a better question is who can introduce me to people that would want to hire me. And that's where the gold is. That's where most people miss out on opportunities. So that's step one is clarity. Step two is having the right mindset about what networking is. And like you said earlier, networking oftentimes has that negative connotation to it because it's thought of as something that's salesy and it's negative from having to do it. And it's negative from having 20 people pitch you their stuff. So it doesn't work on both sides. So, so second is the right mindset about networking and what networking is really building relations. It's really about just building relationships to where we can collaborate with one another and create bigger wins. We can create win-win opportunities, but that doesn't happen until we get to know each other. I don't create win-win opportunities. We just like, I don't know somebody. Hey, let's create a win-win opportunity. What do you do? I mean, so you build a relationship. You get a lot of those emails. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just because you, emails. Yeah. They just send it to you. Say, hey, let's cut to the chase. Let's not waste any time. But but that's the thing is like having the right mindset. So the analogy I like to use on that is is a game of poker. So usually when we play poker, we're, the game is played against each other. 
right? So if we're all sitting around a table and we're all holding our cards up, we're playing against the other players. And oftentimes there's parallels between this game of poker and the game of business. So poker, you look at your hand and you got to pretend like you got a good hand or you pretend like you don't have a good hand. You're just faking the whole time. And people do that in business all the time. They may be struggling and they, hey, how you doing? Oh, business is wonderful. Everything's great. And then they go home and cry because business is definitely not great. So it's, but how can somebody help if they think they're okay? So, so there's, there's that. And, and so what, what it's like in the game of poker is that if I ask you, Josh, Hey, can I see your cards? Cause I, I'm, my cards are terrible. Can I see your cards? You're not going to show me your cards. And in fact, you're going to hold them closer and lean back. You're going to hide them. So, like physically you'll lean back. Like, no, you can't see my cards. Mm. Okay. So how do we get people that we talk to, to lean forward, to lean in? And the best way to do it is not to ask them for something, but to offer something. So if I said, hey, Josh, do you, I flip my cards around. Do you need any of these cards right here? Then all of a sudden you're going to lean in. You're going to say, let me see what you got. Okay, let me have the two and the three. I don't know why you want the two and the three. They're the lowest cards in the deck. But I don't know that you already have a three, four, and five, and you get two, three. Now you have two, three, four, five. You have a straight. It meant nothing to me to have the two and the three. And in the business world, there's people that have all these connections, but don't realize how significant that connection is to somebody else in their network. But it might be useless to them as far as directly, not useless as a person, but I meant useless from a business right. standpoint that maybe That's they'll never do business point. together. But they could yeah. be a game changer for this other person, just like you completed a straight. Now you discard two just because you had to. You threw two cards away and they happen to be hearts and you don't realize I have three hearts already. Now your two hearts complete mine and I have, a, I have a flush. So if we can change the game to where we just focus more on like, how can we help everyone improve their hands? That's the kind of game that we can all elevate our hands at that table. And if you and me start trading cards against anyone else, no matter what their skill level is, you and I are going to win most of those hands at that table simply because we're collaborating. And as others see that we're winning, they're going to want in. And the third person says, hey, why do you guys win all the time? Oh, it's because we exchange cards. They say, well, I want in too. I'm tired of losing. And guess what happens when the whole table is playing the same game? Then we all create higher cards. It's not about who has the highest. There's always going to be somebody who has the highest. And it might not always be us. But if we can improve our situation from where we were before, that's the right mindset about what true networking is. It's not about do I get a sale? It's like creating bigger wins through these collaborations that we can trust going forward. That's awesome. So was that step three? Is that right? Out no, of the seven so, so, that, so this is all, so that's mindset, just understanding what networking is about. Step three is the tools, tools and systems and processes. That's the calendar app that we both use, electronic calendar. Hey, find a time that's convenient for you. So gotcha. using all systems and tools, social media, which we talked about earlier and just staying in touch and building your brand and visibility and, and doing it as a person, not just your business. And a lot of times people will think of just, branding themselves and, and just keep putting their, their stuff out there. Like if you're a realtor and you just keep putting only house stuff and nobody's not, somebody's not in the market for house, why would they want to keep following you? Right. You know, but if you put the food you eat and you're going out different places and you're traveling or you're just going through, you know, then, then, then you're a person now that also happens to be a realtor that can help them when they're in that time of need. So same thing with your designers. If they, they just need to be present, put enough out there to where they know what they do, but everything else can then become social. And just stay in touch and stay in front of people. So I don't need to say, yeah. hey, I'm a networker. How are you? I'm a networker. No, they just see that's what I do. But I, I'll share pictures of, you know, me and, my, and Belinda go out on a date or, you know, we're doing something with the kids or we're at a life event or we're traveling or something like that. All we need, I put my fish tank back here. I put pictures of my fish tank. And then that's just another hook to stay top of mind, it, you know. People that aren't networkers aren't going to want to follow me if I'm just a networker, but they like the fish tank and yeah. they'll go to out of state and go to see an aquarium and say, Hey, I thought of you. I saw these fish mm -hmm. over there. And so, so it's all hooked. So for, for those of your listeners that are out there, it's like, how do you stay top of mind is put out there what you do, but then just become a person and, and, and be the first person they remember when it comes to their website or design or whatever else other services that they offer. So, so three is just getting all those systems in place. And to me, those are all the excuses of why people don't do step four, which, like I said, meeting people is in the middle of the seven steps. So that's step four is meeting other people. Um, the reason people don't go out there and say, oh, yeah, I need to work on my LinkedIn first. Oh, I need to work on my website before I go out there. I'm still kind of fine tuning some stuff or, you know, I don't have business cards yet. I need to order those or I want to go to electronic business cards. I need to set that up. All excuses. So I'm like, why don't you just set all those up? Take the time to set all of those things up. 
So you don't have those excuses. And so not only that, but you feel confident going to the event. You, you're confident going to meet people. And by having all those things set up too, you don't need to do a lot of talking when you get to the event. Because I know part of the fear I had when I went to the event is if they kept talking and I wasn't presenting, then I'm not getting value. I'm not, I'm not going to mm. sell anything because they didn't learn about it. But as I had all of those step three things done, all the systems, the tools, the social media, I could meet at, event, at an event for the first time, talk about you the whole time, talk about me almost 0% of the time. And then before we, you were done talking for several minutes, I say, Chris, I, um, tell me about what you do real quick, or I could share like just a one liner or just my elevator pitch. But what I want to do is I want to just stay in touch with you. I say, Hey, are you on LinkedIn, Facebook? Do you want to stay connected? You say, yeah, let's connect on there. Now we get on our phone, we connect, but I'm going to use what you see on what you see on social media to do the connection and the selling and building all the trust, because that's going to mean more than anything that I tell you at the event. Anyway, I'd rather be like, I didn't tell you anything. And you go online, you're like, wow, that dude's pretty cool. I like this guy. Mm -hmm. guy, Wow. He does that too. Oh, I didn't know they do this. So we're already connecting more. And I didn't, and this isn't even something I'm directly talking to you about. And that's when you talk about people's brand and reputation preceding them. So to build trust with people and stay top mind. So that's, that's where all of these come into play for that step four, which, and that's why it's, it's preparing for that, for that moment. Preparing okay. So I'll, let me, Oh, why am I quizzing myself? I want to take a guess at what number five is. Would number five be something in the realm of like building authority or trust with social media and things like that? Yes. Yeah, so you're close. It's, it's pretty much, it's, I'll, I'll say it's correct. Um, yeah. So, so step five is actually building relationships. Okay. It's, I'm taking so, notes on this, by the way, if you see me typing. Yeah, it's very similar. So, it's, so step five is building relationships. So what that is, is understanding what relationship is, Re- understanding relationship strength, under- understanding that the stronger that your relationships are, the stronger and bigger your ask can be. And so an analogy I like to share is like for anyone that's, you know, asked their their uh, spouse to marry them, by the time they asked that question, they were probably 100% sure of what that answer was. Like if you say 99%, it's almost laughable. It's like, what you thought that it's almost a hundred percent by the time you ask that question because of the strength of the relationship. And you look at the business, why isn't it the same thing in business? Why are we asking for things where there's a 10% shot or a 2% shot that they're in? I mean, you talked about all the cold pitches and the messages that you're getting. It's not effective. And not only is it not effective, but it, it, it puts a distance relationship wise between the two people. And the reason I say that is because let's say that you sent me a message and um, it was a pitch, right? So let me flip it. Let me say, I send you a message and it was just a, a, a pitch, like straight out pitch. Hey, Josh, I could change your life and here's how I can do it. Let me share you some, share some stuff with you. Um, and then I see you later that day in the afternoon or a week later or two weeks later, you, you, um, you know, I've, 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 I've left messages for you. You're like, I'm busy. I'm not calling that back right now. I got other things. I got appointments that wasn't unscheduled. So that wasn't scheduled. So you just move on with it. I see you a few weeks later and you see me, you know, chances are you're not running up and giving me a hug as soon as you see me. Cause I just spammed you and sent you all this stuff and you didn't yeah. respond. You owe me a couple of calls and some emails back. Right. So it's causing some distance relationship wise, and I'm not getting an answer. You're never going to answer me and say why you're not interested or that you're not interested. And sometimes People would rather hear that, hey, I'm not interested for this reason or another. So they don't keep following up and saying, hey, how about now? So, but, but let's say that we don't do that. And you and I, we meet and we just build a relationship. And I could be up front and say, hey, here's the services. Um, you know, Josh just wanted to see if I could spend some time with you uh, and, and share what I do uh, because it, it may or may not be for you. But at least if you understand what I do, you could keep me in mind for other people that might use my services. Would it be? You, would you have 15 minutes to where we can just sit down and I could share this? Cause we haven't had a chance to do that yet. And usually by the time I do this, I've probably, probably already done the same for you. Mm. I've probably led by asking you and saying, Josh, who are you looking to connect with? What, what's a good connection for you? So again, it's, it's building that relational bank account. Up. So understand oh, relation good. is building a relational bank account. You can't go to the, if, if a bank sends you an ATM card, you can't go and take money out if you haven't put money in yet. 
You still have to put money in before you take money out. Relationships are the same way. You need to deposit before you ask for a withdrawal. And you look at why most things don't work with all this cold outreach is because they haven't made any deposits to even get a call back. And, and so now if I make an offer to somebody or share something with somebody, they should feel comfortable enough to say, hey, Chris, you know what? It's just not for me right now. Here's the reason. They don't even need to explain the reasons, but they usually do. Here's the reasons why. It, it just changes it. And now we That's maintain great. the relationship. But more importantly, they can keep me in mind for referrals. They say, hey, it's not for me at this time for X, Y, Z reason. You know, I'm not ready for a website right now for X, Y, Z reason. But I do know people all the time. I run across a lot of entrepreneurs. I run across a lot of startups. I run across people that are scaling up and they need to upgrade. Um, I can keep you in mind for that. So the, the relationship stays intact. So building relationships is, is step five. Um, so that's, so you were close. It was pretty much right. You know, not, uh, similar, similar to, yeah, to cause the, you could still thing. like, yeah, you could, I would imagine you could lump in authority building with the relationship because that does build like, for example, if I met you, Chris, at a networking event, I didn't know anything about you, thought you were a cool dude, liked your fish tank story and then saw you on LinkedIn. Then I'm like, Holy crap. He like wrote the book on networking, which I want to talk about here, that immediately adds way more levity to that relationship because I'm like, now there's an element of trust. Like you obviously mm -hmm. have experience, you've wrote about it professionally. So yeah, that, uh, I imagine a relationship could be the tank for all sorts of fish. I, I'm a terrible at analogies. Uh, you're <laughs> so much better, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, but you're on the right track because that's actually heading into step six which is building a brand and your personal network is having your own network rather than mm. being part of other networks, but also having your own network is powerful. Having your own brand is powerful because there, there are times where, you know, I had one partnership where they said that, uh, you know, we, you've been interviewing for a year already. You just don't know it. They, they've mm. already been watching me for some time before we even had our first talks. So those kind of things happen. People are watching you and seeing what you do and how you respond. And trustworthiness is is um, is built into the person, not the title, not the role. The person is the one that needs to be trustworthy. And so if you build trust personally, then whatever you offer business wise, you're going to have credibility. So right now, I would say if I if I wanted to go into any other position, that the the trust should travel with me. If I want to go be a realtor, if I want to sell cars, if I want to do auto detailing, if I want to start a different kind of company, the trust should travel with me. Mm. And that's how you know when you're building a personal brand is that there you build a brand for you. The company and the entity and the name has a brand because you're behind it. That's not, great. The, not by itself. Trust travels. Let's quote it and yeah. get it on a T-shirt. That's yeah. a great <laughs> little quote, man. Yep. I'm going to have to write that down myself. I'm going to need the show notes. Um, <laughs> yep. <laughs> Trust travels. We're going to quote it. We're going to do yeah. something with that. Yeah. So it, it travels and and that sets us up for the final step, which is step seven. So remember I said before that getting a sale is good. It's, it's part of it, but it's thinking small to get a sale, to get a client. Step seven is not getting a sale. Step seven is creating winning collaborations and partnerships. Mm. That's not a sale. That's a series of sales. That's an ongoing source, an ongoing resource for future sales. And as you do that, networking now all of a sudden gives you time back. Instead That's of taking great. time prospecting, it gives you time back because you have the people coming to you and they're already 90% of the way through your funnel as far as having to build trust and showing them, oh, here's the work that I've done. Here's examples. They already know that. If the person referred them, they know you're good. You don't need to spend as much time on your qualifications. You spend more time saying, what exactly are you looking for? What do you need? And here's what I can do to help you get there. And here's my pricing structure. Which one works better for you? I love that challenge of not thinking small and not thinking short-sighted like one cell. Like what if it is multiple win-win situation, multiple sales and, and multiple, like multiple expanded network. That is what a great cap to that framework, Chris, because I do feel like when anyone would think of some sort of networking framework that I would, I would think like maybe sale is in the middle and then like follow up would be an existing framework, but that all fits with that idea of creating like a win-win relationship and yeah. Ongoing sales. Like my gosh, that, ah, oh, that's beautiful. Can you recap the seven real quick? Yep. So number one is clarity, gain clarity. Two is mindset, having the right mindset. 
Three is setting up your systems and tools. That's including your social, your calendar, your website, all of that stuff. Um, four is getting out and meeting new people. So that's the fourth step. Fifth step is building relationships. Step six is building your personal brand and your personal network, having people around you, having a circle of people that trust you. And step seven is building, uh, creating winning collaborations and partnerships. And for people that are out there that say, you know, that's what I do. I, I want to build more partnerships, right? I see that. I don't try to make sales. I want to create the partnership. Most of the time, they're going to miss out on opportunities because they don't have the other steps in place. They haven't mm. slowed down to set everything else up. So what happens is that they have that dream connection that is right there available to them or somebody can introduce them to them. And they either subconsciously don't feel ready and sabotage it, or they don't show up to the meeting uh, subconsciously. Like, it's not like, hey, I'm not going to show up to that meeting, but things happen and somehow they just let it fall apart because they really didn't want to be there. Um, or they have the boldness to go through with it, but then that ideal partner, collaboration partner looks at them on social and it doesn't build trust for whatever reason, either because they put crazy political stuff on there. They put crazy stuff on there. They don't have a presence on there, but either way, it doesn't look like somebody that has an equal amount of, of uh, vesting in it or credibility or clout or whatever it is. So, so that's why step six, as far as building a personal network that opens the door to partnerships, because just this is an uh, example. If, if you have a really nice car, and a friend of yours says, hey, Josh, can I borrow your car? Can I have the keys for the weekend? And they don't have a car or their car is like a beater, right? It's got trash in there. They got all kinds of food in there. And chances are you're probably not going to want to let them borrow your car. You're not giving them the keys to your car. It's not going to happen. But let's say that your friend has an equally nice car or an even nicer car than you have. Same situation. They come to you and say, hey, can I borrow your car for the weekend? Just the fact that they have the same or better car than you you're more likely to hand those keys over just because your friend needs it. You don't even, you might not even ask why they need it. You just say, yeah, here you go because of what they have. And if people have a network, then they're going to be more trustworthy to be in other people's networks as well. So uh, as, as, as your listeners, yeah, as your listeners look to do that, really there, it, it's hard to sell web services, hard to sell design. Like how can you just go to somebody on the street and tell them, here's what I can do for you. You really should have this. It's, it's something, it would be good for you. It'd be bad. That's a hard sell. Why not just cater to people that already know they have a need and are looking for the right person and to be able to just continually do that. So that's where it, it goes both ways. You know, whoever um, you're listed are, they're going to have other people, other services that they don't do themselves or don't want to. It's not their expertise or it's not in their wheelhouse. They become the referral partner for somebody else. And it's a yeah. win-win because if you send them to somebody that's trustworthy and reliable, they like you. If I send you to a good mechanic and they took care of you and they gave you a better deal and they, and you felt, you know, really good about that, that helps me, that helps you, that helps the mechanic. So that's what I, it is with collaboration. I love that. I keep on going back to this quote we just came up with, which is trust travels because when it, when it comes to referrals, that is a biggie. Like if you, Chris referred me to as a web designer, when, you know, years ago when I was designing websites for everybody, you better trust me to do a good job for somebody because if I did a terrible job, that will reflect on you. And that is so, so important at the end of this framework when it comes to having like winning collaborations and partnerships, that trust factor. Uh, so man, trust travels. This has been like a masterclass, Chris, in networking. <laughs> I would imagine this is why it was probably a really good time for you to write a book. So tell me about, as we wrap this up, tell me about the book, man. Is, is this framework in the book or what is the book all about? Yep. The, the book is called Networking Essentials for Success, and it's designed for somebody who's either been networking for a while and not seeing the results or somebody who's starting from scratch and just wants to save time and hassle and all the aggravation of figuring out how to do it. And, and that's what this whole framework is is based around. Is, is It's all in that book. So it's a seven-step journey to accomplish your goals through authentic relationships and collaborative communities. So that's really what it's about is relationship first. Bigger part of that is, is community that we get to create and it just feeds the cycle. So the stronger communities we have, the better all of us do. And guess what? We all don't have to spend as much time prospecting cold clients when we have a yes. community of people. Holla. That's yes. That's honestly, as I think about it, my personal insight 
on this whole conversation is that what you just said is what networking meant to me. It meant that I didn't have to hard sell. It just Mm -hmm. meant that I could connect and be who I am and share what I know and share what I do, share the results. And the rest takes care of itself as far as getting referred out. And then of course, with your framework, all the elements, really, as I think about all the elements that I learned in in, in in-person networking came into play at some point in your framework. It just took 10 years to put it all in there. I should have just read your book if it was available. So speaking of, talk about a segue to the book. Is your book available on your website, Chris, at chrisborha.com or is there a better place? I mean, so at the time of the releasing this, I think it'll be just after the book releases. So so yeah, to you, man, where would you like my audience to go if they want to check out the book and, and learn more about you? Yep. They can just go to chrisborha.com is perfectly fine. I'll have another website specifically for the book called networking essentials for success.com. But all of those, the easiest ways is go to my personal website and I'll have links to everything from there. So just go to chrisborha, B-O-R-J-A.com. Yes, that is a J-A. I think the first time I met you, I was like, hi, Chris Borgia. Uh, before I was, before I had a podcast and I was cultured and learned different, uh, uh, pronunciations and stuff. So I'll make sure we have that linked in the show notes, of course, for everybody. Um, but man, Chris, I, I actually, I, I have maybe one final question for you, but I'd actually almost like to turn this over to you as we wrap this up. Like for my audience of web designers who networking is not generally the the first priority. Like I feel like if you get into real estate, you're probably going to you're going to know that you're going to have to get yourself out there and probably going to go to some networking stuff. Like there's industries where, you know, networking is a part of it. Web designers tend to get into it often accidentally. And then it's like, Oh shoot, I need to sell. I need to like meet people. And I'm terrified to get out there. Like, I guess I would like to just give you an opportunity to maybe share maybe just some quick advice for those type of people. We've covered a lot here, but is there maybe one uh, thought that has resonated with you that you'd like to share to those people who, you know, networking just isn't natural. It's, it's hard right now for them. Yeah, I think, I think that's one aspect and one element is the, the comfort of doing it. But I think the other uh, real, real life element is time, right? If you're, if you're working on things for clients, you don't have time to go out and network at which point you need to decide on, do I hire somebody and, and they become the face and, and have a regular presence out there. But I, I would encourage whatever you need to do to either do it yourself, schedule some time to do it, which would be my preferred way because you are the brand. Remember, you're the brand and you don't turn yourself over. You know, other employees can be turned over, sales team, and that ends up being the opposite effect of trust, right? If they say, hey, there's, I'll just wait for the next salesperson. Oh, mm-hmm. what happened to the last guy? So I, I think personal branding is really important. It's probably worth your time in investing into a few groups. You can't be part of all the groups the same way you can't major in everything. Pick a couple of groups that you enjoy being at and be a regular and serve and give. And that's probably enough to keep you busy. If you just grow deeper instead of like, you know, wide, you know, miles wide, but an inch deep type thing, I think just digging deeper roots is enough to to, to feed you and, and your business until you can scale and, you know, have somebody take over roles either on the front side of uh, meeting people or on the back side of actually doing the work. But I would say to invest that time. And I I use the word invest intentionally because it is an investment. It is going to cost you. It's going to cost you some of your time on the front end, but it's an investment meaning that it comes back many times over. It's not a one for one deal. It can, it's, it's going to bring back exponential results as you build it. And you've seen people out there that have done this and accomplished this and you might wonder, how do they grow such a big business? Why does everyone just go to them? I don't even see their advertising. I don't see them doing this. How do they get their clients? They, they've probably figured out how to network. So I would say to, to invest the time, find the time, make the time, just like fitness, just like going to the gym. There's going to be times you don't want to go, which is like every time for most people, they don't want to go. But you never leave the gym saying, oh, I knew I shouldn't have come in today. And the same thing with networking, you'll never leave an event and say, I knew I shouldn't have come in here because even if the event was terrible, worst case scenario, event was terrible, poorly run, all that kind of stuff. But you met one good good person, it was worth it coming to that event. And when you know what you're doing, you create environments. You don't need to be at a networking event to network. You could be on the sideline at your kid's soccer game. You could be at your your uh, jogging or cycling club or whatever things you do uh, for fun, or you could be at your church because now you know that networking isn't selling. Networking is building relationships and it opens up all these new channels for you that you're already doing now 
without having to change anything on your schedule. It's just a mindset of realizing that I'm running across these people. Let me see what they need. You know, is there anything that they need? And start there. Most people are reciprocal and they'll say, you know, thank you. I really appreciate that. How about you? What, what can I do for you? And they're not trained. You know, they're not even trained, but it's just human nature to want to reciprocate. If you serve somebody, they'll want to serve you back. So whatever you want, do that for other people. If you want referrals, give other people referrals. If you want them to ask you for your business card, you off, ask them for theirs first. Hey, do you have a business card, Josh? Yeah, here you go. How about you, Chris? Do you have a business card? So whatever you put out there, in most cases, it's going to reciprocate. So when you, you know, just just understanding these dynamics, hopefully that that helps you. So um, as far That's as great. building, you just understand that you know that the time is, element is going to be there, but networking will will put more time back on your schedule. The golden of rule of networking: network unto others as you would like to have network unto you. <laughs> There it is, Chris. This has been awesome, man. This has literally been like a networking 101 masterclass. So I really appreciate your time. It's been awesome reconnecting with you. I've so enjoyed staying in touch. Like you said, I mean, this is kind of an interesting case study, this conversation, because six, five, six years ago, we could have very easily just disconnected and just lost touch with each other. But we have stayed connected just with our social media presence. And uh, when I heard you writing the book on it, I was like, oh, here we go. It's time. I want to pick your brain on this. So, man, thank you for dishing out the goods, Chris. And I love what you're up to, man. Keep it up. Thanks again for your time today, dude. All right. Thank you. All right, friends. So I hope you enjoyed that episode. Isn't Chris awesome? Like, again, we just talked about this, but... I just love his story of going from an introvert who dreaded networking to somebody who is now teaching it and is so passionate about it because he grew his business and it's done wonders for him. It did wonders for me and it'll do wonders for you and you can do it at whatever level you want to. So cheers to your networking endeavors. I'd love to hear from you on your takeaways from this episode. You can leave us a comment at joshhall.co slash 253 to leave a comment for this post, this episode's post. And again, check out Chris's book, Networking Essentials for Success. It's his seven-step framework. We will have that linked in the show notes for this episode. Again, if you're catching this uh, while it airs before May of 2023, Chris is going to be coming inside of Web Designer Pro, which is my web design community, and he'll be doing a live training. And you can join us and ask some questions live and get to talk with Chris directly. So super excited about that as well. Any questions, let me know as always. And again, make sure you subscribe. And I will see you guys on the next episode, unless you're too busy bouncing between networking groups.